everyone, I'm Steve, Mark's working late tonight, and this is Smokey Steve and Mark. Either welcome or welcome back, and happy Thursday. Hope everyone's well, everyone's safe, look after yourselves, especially in these, you know, continuing trying times. Um, that's the PSA for today. So, Thursday, story time! want to thank all of you who've been consistently watching the story times. Um, they are... Again, something new we've only done maybe for a couple months, maybe six or seven of them. And the topics, I'm trying to keep them kind of diverse. There were some requests for some jail stuff, so I did a few of those. Um, and then a couple different requests had come through via email and then uh, via Facebook on Messenger. And one of the ones that had come up prior to the story time series was being gay, which I know a little bit about, and being Catholic. I happen to be, I was raised Catholic, and what that experience may have been like. I also went to a Catholic school. Uh, my family is practicing Catholics, and I live in a very Catholic area. Catholic, Catholic, Catholic. Um, Christian, Catholic, mostly Catholic. Now there's some evangelicals around, but it was mostly Catholic growing up. So what was that like for me growing up um, being different and what did that look like as I got older? And then I guess kind of what does that look like now, being part of a family that's Catholic, but I don't practice. So, uh, I was born in July, uh, 1982. And I was the third child, uh, of my parents. And baptism was just what you did because you get the baby baptized. And there was this like old Irish, I'm Irish Catholic. My, my mom's, Irish, my dad's half of the family is Irish and German, English, something. I'll figure it out. Uh, so that was the practiced faith for both. And there was the old thing of like, don't let the baby leave the house until it's baptized, because if it dies without being baptized, it'll go to limbo, which the Vatican says doesn't even exist anymore. But up until that point, apparently it did, and that's where dead babies who weren't baptized first went. So I got baptized. And then that started the series of sacraments that go with. Uh, Catholicism has seven, maybe eight if you're a priest, I forget. Um, and there's only three that you need to really be in the club. Baptism, Holy Eucharist, Confirmation. So, going through a Catholic school, I learned quite a bit about uh, Catholic dogma and uh, Christian history and things like that. Obviously, I had theology every single year from kindergarten through 12th grade. And my first year of college, I dodged it because it was an elective. I had to take it, but I could have taken it within any one of the four years. And prayer books, little assembled, I don't know, when I was in first, second, and third grade, they would always have us put together these little milk carton things that were flat. And we'd put them together and flip the top over and there'd be a little coin slot. And it was money for the missions. These missions were never clearly defined. I don't know who we were sending our milk money to or who we were groveling for, but they said we were sending our money to the missions. Okay. I'm sure it went to a good cause, but, you know, they were just using us as children to panhandle for a good cause. So growing up as a kid in a Catholic school, it was, I didn't know any better. You know, I grew up like I said, I was the youngest, so my parents had already done this twice with more docile children who didn't ask as many inflammatory questions through grade school. And then I got my first communion when I was in second grade. So that was, that was a thing. And then when did we go through eighth grade? I got confirmation. So uh, the only reason I liked my confirmation is because I got to pick a middle name because of my, I think my family's Catholic tradition where you select a middle name at confirmation. Legally, I don't have one. Uh, my middle name is an alias because it's not on any of my documents. I was using it for a while because it felt fun to have a middle name, but now I don't like it and I don't like to use it and I'm still trying to get it off my license. But that was the fun part of it. That was the only reason I got confirmation is because I got to pick a name. Um, and then I was confirmation sponsor for one of my cousins. And I was kind of hesitant at the time because I was like, I really don't, by that point, I was like, I really don't believe any of this. And uh, I was told, just do it. It's a nice thing to do for your cousin. I was like, I'll do it if you concede. It's all crap. It, I was a, a volatile teenager. So when did the gay thing come up? Well, right around puberty is when I started getting inklings that, you know, whatever age boys start developing. 
and finding themselves and exploring themselves. I'm not making eye contact, you know what I mean. Uh, that was around the age I started to get the idea that I was thinking more about men than about women in a sexual way. So, I'm Catholic, so this is not possible. This is not possible. Um, even if I were gay, I can't be gay. So, I went through the motions. I had little girlfriends. I had a couple. One, not serious. One, as far as high school goes, serious. We were together for a little while. Um, of course, she's a lesbian now, too. Good for her. And I was fat for most of my childhood. Sometime around 10th grade, I started losing some weight. And that's when the eating disorder kicked in and the weight whew, fell off. So suddenly I'm not the fat kid. But as my personality starts to come out a little bit and I become a little more confident and I'm a little more talkative, it suddenly becomes clear that I'm a bit more maybe effeminate and outgoing than was previously thought. And I've gone from being the fat kid to being the gay kid. Now... Just for reference here, I did not come out until I was in college, so I was a closeted gay kid in a Catholic school. And I'm always the last to know things everyone knew before me. And I mean, I had kind of known in the back of my head, like I said, around puberty, I kind of had the inkling. So I thought maybe I'm bisexual. I don't know. And then again, I had to say, even if I was gay, I can't be gay because I'm Catholic. So it, it's kind of a moot thing to explore. It's not even going to matter. Um, so that evolved, that went into, uh, my senior year and I was still, I was with a girl at the time. It was, she was Glenda the Good Witch and I was the Tin Man and the Wizard of Oz. Um, and then when it got to senior year, I was Rolf, the Nazi messenger boy in The Sound of Music. I was in musicals, I was on the choir, you know, when I finally did come out, my mom told my aunt and she was like, you're surprised, you know. Um, my brother's response was like, you know, no shit, I knew since you were 16. I'm always the last to know. I'm always the last to know things. I digress. So leaving, you know, this bubble, and I stopped incrementally practicing things of my faith going along. I mean, early, it was right around the age that I started to um, find my own identity at all as as a sexual person or it even started i mean we're talking like 12 13 altar boy gone don't want to do it anymore it was weird it always felt weird i don't like spending time when i was a kid with older men i just didn't like it i was never molested i was never touched inappropriately i never had an inappropriate conversation with a member of the clergy uh female male anything but I didn't like the circumstances. I didn't like the situations. And I remember watching, I don't know how I came to watch it. There was an after school special about uh, touchy priests that I remember. I don't know why. There was two videos I had to watch. One was from the church and it was about how to be an altar boy and about how you can be an altar boy when there's only one and you throw the thing over your arm and you can pour with both hands. And uh, the damn albs never fit anyway. I would have to get, like, practically another priest's outfit because I was so damn fat. Not part of the story. So that didn't, that wasn't part of my experience. I know a lot of people have an axe to grind for that, and uh, they do. Even in the Diocese of Scranton here, there were priests that I had been altar server with numerous times who, now that they are passed, accusations have come out again saying, they were doing this for years. I know of at least three that I was an altar boy for who had, I don't know, it, no inhibitions when it came to <laughs> exploring themselves outside of the altar, I guess. Uh, so coming out, I it was like four months after high school. It was, I was beginning my freshman year of college at a Jesuit university. Now, Jesuit is like Catholic, but... They recycle. I, I'm not, you know what I mean? Like, they're a little more liberal. A little more liberal. Not too much, but a little more liberal. So I show up with my new sense of self at uh, college, and this was my summer of raver transformation, where I maxed out my credit card and found a new self. And I had my, my three colors of hair and my 18 facial piercings and tattoos and all sorts of other stuff dressed up in like a little girl t-shirt and a pair of parachute pants and a backwards hat. And I stuck out. I stuck out. I did manage to make some friends uh, and ended up going to Philly over fall break with a friend and had my first man-on-man -man kiss. It was very innocent. Um, 
and then came home. And my college friends were the people I told that I was um, out, that I was gay first, because I kind of felt like they were on the periphery. And none of them were super de duper Catholic. They were all kind of like me. They grew up in a Catholic household, and it did a fair bit of damage <laughs> to their sense of self-worth and uh, instant guilt and depravity. And the, the inherent depravity of the human state was what pretty much stuck with most of us, that we were born bad and irredeemable and 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 whatnot. So we all kind of had, a, had that dark sense of humor, that kind of... Uh, and we all had the gift of gab. A lot of us were Irish as well. So coming home, now I'm coming out. Now what do I do? My family is still rather Catholic. They all went to the same Catholic university, <laughs> including my father and my mother, who was a church mouse, who when she was in high school would go to six o'clock mass every day before school for fun. This was going to get messy, I thought. So I called my mother and told her I was gay, or I told her a boy kissed me or something like that. And I was hysterical, and I thought, I'm going to get disowned. I thought a lot of people get disowned when, when they come out as gay. I had a lot of friends in college who, unfortunately, their friends were their only family. They had no blood family because of theological, social, moral disagreements about uh, whether or not a person can be gay. You know, it's like, I don't accept that you're gay. It's like not accepting that it's raining. It's happening whether you accept it or not. So get with it or go away. Uh, so I told my mother and I, I thought I was going to get like thrown out of the family. So I disappeared for a while because I thought, well, that's that, you know. I mean, when it had come up in high school, when people would pick on me and say this and that, my mother, after the fact, after I came out and after some time had passed, I said, why didn't you tell us, you know, people were doing that. I was like, what would you have said? Well, are you? And what if I said, I don't, what was I going to say? Yes. You know, I was, it was, I was 17 in the late nineties. This was before Will and Grace. This was before Lady Gaga was born this way. Granted, it was after Madonna expressed herself. So there were some, you know, ground spells here, um, of, of diversity. So some ground had been broken, but not too much. This is still a relatively backwards area when some of those things come up, uh, so I wasn't, then my mother was okay with the gay thing. She, she got okay pretty quick. My dad took a minute, but then he was okay too. Um, my brother, I was worried about telling because he's like super de duper de duper de Catholic, like big deal, big, big deal, like marches and stuff. And like, I went to his dorm room to tell him and there was like figurines all over his room because he's two years older. I was a freshman and he was a junior at the same college at the time. And there was rosaries and I think holy water and just icons. It felt like everybody's watching. So I went and told him and he, it was such a shock. I was taken back. He was like, oh, I've known for, for a couple years. Why didn't you tell me? I, at the time when I was, this is my only like not bitter, bitter, not bitter, because I understand there had been no other gay people in the family. Nobody knew how to deal with it. I didn't know what the hell was going on. I fumbled my way through and we all have a good relationship now. So I think all's well that ends well. But at the time I was mad. And then I told my best friend and he came out three months later. We'd been friends since kindergarten. I'm like, why didn't you say anything? I could have used someone to talk to. That was the only angst I had coming out after. I was like, if everybody knew, why didn't they were waiting for me to find out myself. And ultimately that was probably best. Ultimately that was probably best. But I, I mean, when they did send me to see a counselor in school, because I was a little off and a little thin and a little mouthy, uh, it was a Roman Catholic deacon. I wasn't going to tell him any of that stuff. None of it. Because I didn't know who it was going to get back to either. I was a minor at the time. So we go through adulthood. My sister gets married. I'm in, you know, in the wedding. I'm an usher in the wedding. Uh, it's Catholic mass. Um, my family's big events are all Catholic events, like weddings, funerals, um, confirmations, obviously sacraments for nephews, nieces, cousins, things like that. So that's still how the family celebrates. That's still how they acknowledge milestones. Where am I in that if I don't practice? And really, where is anybody if they don't, for whatever reason, if they don't engage, but their family does. So it took me a while to kind of find my space in all that, to kind of say, no, I'm not going to church with you guys. Um, and I only do that a couple times. Sometimes on the holidays I go, sometimes I don't. Usually I don't like Christmas and Easter, especially Easter. I hate Easter. Um, and it would be a trade-off. Sometimes they would go to, like, if everyone was having big family Christmas at my parents' house, 
They'd go to church. I would stay behind, like for Christmas Eve, and make dinner and cook and whatnot. So when everybody came home, they'd have something to eat. I'd spend a lot of time in the kitchen kind of doing that sort of stuff. So I enjoyed the holidays and I tried to be part of the experience, but that part of it, which wasn't for me, the going to church part of it, I just left left out. Um, I used to try to ruin it for everybody <laughs> in having like religious debate and discussion and all that kind of stuff. But that got old as I got old and that got old as everybody got a little bit older. And I'd kind of just don't engage really in debate about is being gay right or wrong? Is it moral? Is it immoral? You know, no one's ever, no one in the family ever broke out Leviticus to me. We'll say that. We'll say that was a good thing. Um, no one ever brought it up and said, what is it, Leviticus 2016, 14, something like that? You know, gay burn in hell, that one. It's right next to the other ones about, like, mixed fiber clothing and sitting on a woman's bed if she just menstruated and uh, mixed poly cotton blends and shellfish and all those other things. Y'all should be in the same handbasket on the way down to hell as me because they're all in the same book. But that's neither here nor there. Um, I think drag queens are okay, though, because I don't think God said you can't dress pretty. Just, just saying. So RuPaul, y'all are fine. So going forward, what does the rest of my life look like? Well, we're going towards transitions now. Now there's young people in the family. So there's going to be communion and confirmation and things like that. And yes, if Uncle Steve is in the area, Uncle Steve is going to go. Because that's not about me. That's not about me and my hangups and my attitude about religion. That's about them. You know, when it is the holidays and if people want me to go, it's important to them that I'm part of of the holiday. Important to them, I'm part of the sacrament and the celebration. Even if that actual event doesn't mean much to me, the fact that it's important to them that I'm there means I need to shut up, get over myself, and just be there. And not ruin it for everybody. <laughs> Especially if it was a young person's kind of thing. Now we're talking about getting older in life. Now, Mark and I have had talks about end of life, and we probably have them a little more frankly because um, Mark has a couple chronic health conditions, and so do I. And we joke in a dark humor sort of way about, you know, who's going to die first and what are the funeral plans and dot, dot, dot. Um, Mark is not a faithful person in any sort of Christian sense. There's no tradition that he follows. So we've talked about his. My family's Catholic. I suspect if I were to pass away, I would have a Catholic funeral. Uh, and I don't, I wouldn't be upset about that. Um, funerals are for the grieving. Funerals are for the living is kind of my interpretation. So if I were to pass away and my family decided to have a funeral, I don't know where they'd put me, but it would be a Catholic funeral because that's how they grieve. That's how they process their grief. That's how they send off their loved ones. That's how they make sense of death. Um, and that's how their faith surrounds their ideas about death. So they would go about it that way. Um, I wouldn't come back and haunt anybody. That's how I would want it too. I would want the people who were alive to be comforted if they were going to miss me. And if that's how they want to remember it, that's fine with me. I'm not going to write a will and say, you know, char my ashes and then throw me in the street. My mother's a little more practical. <laughs> She's, she doesn't want all the attention on her, she, even in death. She said to just put her out with the trash. Assuming she dies at home, I guess. So... So it's kind of colored, it's, it's being gay and, and not that you can't be gay and be part of a faith community too. There's plenty that are accepting and there's plenty where it's no big deal. I didn't feel compelled to seek any of those out because being Christian wasn't really for me. Um, and the gay thing was just the nail in the coffin, but there were a lot of other reasons I didn't agree with it too. So that kind of like put that with it, how I navigate life now and how I gab when I was young, I kept the gay thing to myself and faked Catholic. Now, as I'm older, the gay thing is kind of like whatever. And I go through the motions of Catholic service and Catholic mass and Catholic sacraments when it's with family and things like that. Or if I go to another person's funeral or that kind of stuff, because it's not to me about the ceremony or the ritual or the dogma. It's about being there at an important time in a person's life. And this just happens to be the circumstances under which that's happening. So, yeah, I, I'm not going to be the political gay at a funeral. This isn't right. These people and those priests and da, 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 da. Even though those people and those priests. Um, but so it goes. So, um, 
that's about that's about the journey of of my journey of being Catholic and gay. Um, again, I'm always the last to know things. Always the last to know things. And uh, we'll see. You know, faith journeys like that, I think, are sometimes never finished. Who knows? Maybe I'll be Episcopalian in a few years. Maybe I'll read something that's inspiring and, and go a different direction. Maybe this opinion will be moot in two years because I've decided to do something else. I don't know. People's belief systems, I think, change over time. There's an idea, and I got it in the 12-step community, and I hate it because I think it's stagnant. Someone will say, I know what I believe. If I believe it on Monday, I'll believe it on Friday. Well, if you're presented with new evidence on Wednesday and you don't change your mind, then you're not solid in your beliefs. You're an idiot. <laughs> if you're presented with new evidence, it should be considered and possibly change your mind, especially if it runs contrary to what I believed. I like to remain stupid in some ways when it comes to things like that. Because, well, they call it remain teachable. I prefer stupid. That way my ego gets out of the way of learning new stuff. Um, so should that come up in my future where I decide to join a faith community or something like that? I'd be open to that. Um, but I, I don't see it happening, but I would never say never. I would never say never. So as long as I can bring Mark and hold his hand. So thank you all for watching and joining me for this story time. Please do subscribe, uh, hit the thumbs up and hit the notification bell on your way out so you get all the alerts when we have a new video and also when we go live. You can follow Mark and I on Facebook at Smokey Steve Space and Mark or on Instagram at Smokey Steve and Mark or on Twitter. Our handle's at Smokey Steve A. Our email address and our contact info is all listed down below as well. Thank you again, and we will catch up with you tomorrow. Feeling a little bit of madness settling in. We'll see, we'll see how that rolls on a Friday. Thanks for watching. Bye.